WWT presents Meet the Chief. Hi, everybody. I'm Tracy Sever, Head of Global Cyber Strategy for Worldwide Technology, and welcome to another episode of Meet the Chief. It's a series that was created to give you insight into the latest innovations and cyber trends, and also give you a chance to meet the executives and founders making it all happen. I'm thrilled to welcome this week's guest, XShop CEO Patrick Dennis, who has decades worth of C-suite uh, executive experience in technology and cyber. Uh, Patrick was named CEO of ExtraHop following company's $900 million acquisition by Bain Capital and Crosspoint Capital back in 2021. They're an innovator in cloud native network detection and response. And the real value that our customers see when they deploy ExtraHop, it's full network transparency and it allows them to better defend against bad actors. So with that said, Patrick, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me, really uh, looking forward to the conversation today. So let's jump right in and talk about something at the top of every board level and CEO's agenda, artificial intelligence. ExtraHop was actually one of the first companies to put itself out there at the position on generative AI earlier this year when you gave an interview with the New York Stock Exchange. Can you talk to us a little bit about the security implications of generative AI and where that's heading into 2024? Yeah, I mean, I think you, you start in a really important place, which is this is a topic um, that's reached board levels uh, for every company, I, I, I think, in the world. And that's pretty rare. It's pretty rare to see the board uniformly interested across industry verticals in a particular subject. And I think that's because of the profound impact generative AI can have on the economy and, and, and frankly, a little bit of the paradox that's created on, on one hand, it probably is the single biggest impact on potential GDP improvements that we've seen. It's certainly in my generation. And, and on the other hand, it's, it's at minimum, probably at minimum misunderstood, um, ranging all the way through to wildly misunderstood. Um, and there's certainly some consequences and some risks. And so, um, what I started in the New York Stock Exchange interview talking about was just this notion that companies are going to need to take advantage of this technology to gain a competitive advantage. And at the same time, they need to be really thoughtful about it as they manage their risks, which I know is something your your audience is particularly interested in. And so um, Extra Hop took a pretty early view that we wanted to help people at minimum have visibility into uh, employees that were making use of these technologies. Um, so that they could get a sense of answering the simple question of, are people using these? If so, how much and what might be the exposure? And back when we announced that capability and re we released it, no one could answer that simple question. And we thought that was a great place to start. Yeah, I, that, I completely agree. It's, it, it's one of the most quickly adoptive, adopted enablers, but also as you know, that it poses a, a huge threat, um, just helps people get things done much faster. And you know that they, they certainly will be latching onto it. So to provide that kind of visibility um, to prepare for, to defend against what that kind of opens up to is, is huge. Yeah, and I think the way I think of it is, um, you know, early days, some people just said, hey, we're gonna turn the capability off, we're gonna block it. Uh, almost a third of the customers we talked to say that. And yet when you ask the follow on question that says, what's the confidence level that you have that people are not using the technology, it goes to 5%. So um, I don't think simply saying to employees, don't take advantage of this technology is, is gonna be um, a reasonable position to take. And at the same time, I think that one of the risks that people kind of don't understand is these models um, as you type information into them and, and you're receiving you know, output back, whatever you've typed into the model is also training the model. And so you could picture uh, a pharmaceutical company being very concerned that they might lose a formula for a particular drug uh, while an employee is trying to do something as simple as find something else they could get in the supply chain. And one of the, one of the nastier parts about those issues in, in this environment is you can't get it back. And so, um, you know, there are some real consequences to what I think sometimes people oversimplify by referring to as data leak. I think it's an entirely different type of data leak um, because once it's in those models, it's, it's for all intents and purposes gone. So be beyond AI, um, what else are you seeing in, in the market in terms of trends and network security? Yeah, I think if you just kind of pan out and you think about security in general right now, people, you know, people are thinking about identity. How do you manage that? It's top of a list for most people. Um, I think 
many people are still kind of wrestling with endpoint or XDR, depending on their maturity there. And then, you know, the third part is really taking shape, which is what does network security really mean? I think if you talk to some customers, they'll say we have a zero trust architecture that we're putting in place. Part of that is about doing network security. You talk to some of my customers and they might go to the historic category of network detection and response. Um, what I think is uniformly true is that people um, people are looking to see more, like I need more visibility, like you said in your opening remarks, because if you see more, then you can know more. And then if you know more, you can take an active step in trying to stop an activity, whether that's a cyber attack or it's misuse of generative AI tools. And, and so I think what really is happening in, in network security is this bedrock truth of what goes on in an environment, it's very hard to evade the network. Um, and all of us are working together to put tools in place to help companies know what's really taking place so that they can make a more active decision. I, I think that probably sounds like it was one of the main things that really drew you to extra hop when you when you took on your role there. Um, you know, we read an article, you described it really as a as a rocket ship that you, uh, you were hopping on board and taking control of, which is um, such an exciting place to be. And I'd love to hear more just from your perspective, you know, when you decided to make the leap and, and come over and, and steer the ship, um, some of those aspects and, and some of the things that went into your decision and also your, your plan for the future. Yeah, I, I ran a company called Guidance Software for a while. They made a product called Encase for all the uh, forensic friends out there in your audience. Um, they'll, all, they'll all remember Guidance. And we took Guidance and we moved it into endpoint detection and response. And to put that in perspective, that set of years, I competed with Carbon Black and Tanium, and CrowdStrike was was kind of a bit of a, was a gleam in George's eye at the time, right? It wasn't even a big player. And I got to see the rise of EDR. And, and frankly, to a large extent, that happened uh, at the expense of people that were sim doing simple antivirus. And so what I've noticed in security specifically is security tends to move in waves. So... There's a great new technology that gets displaced by the next new technology that gets displaced by the next new technology. And when I saw Extra Hop, I thought to myself, OK, one of the challenges in an EDR company is the visibility between endpoints. So you get great visibility at the endpoint. Um, but if you ever wanted to know, like, what got you from one endpoint to another endpoint? How did somebody move laterally? Like, that was very difficult to see. And so this idea of having this, you know, kind of bedrock of truth of network communication and being able to synthesize that with what might be taking place on an endpoint, I thought would give, uh, you know, our teams a significant advantage um, versus even the most sophisticated attackers. And so um, one part of this was like the core technology. The other part was just simply the trend toward more advanced attacks. And so, you know, we've all see that on, seen that unfold. And so you need a more robust set of tools to combat it. So it was like, okay, I've seen this as we transition from signature-based virus software through to EDR. Um, I think we're going to see the same shift into network security. Felt like the right time. And that's why I often jokingly refer to it as the rocket ship. It's like the exact right time. You need more advanced technology to deal with the more advanced threats. And we've seen this happen before in, the, in this market. Absolutely. It's, uh, we're excited not only about your technology, but the partnership and the outcomes that it's, it's driving. Um, one of the things you did mention in your, in your kind of description of, of where the threats are lying, it, it really has a lot to do with the integration piece. Can you talk a little sure. bit about some of your key partners um, on the technology side that you guys integrate with? Yeah, well, uh, let's just start with you. Um, cause I think that's, that's actually fun. We were very thoughtful about our partnership with you folks because of your deep network understanding, you know, there's a lot of history, uh, at your company with understanding customers networks and helping build some of the biggest networks in the world with those customers. And so, you know, we've been thoughtful down to, um, even our in market partners, how we think about that. Uh, but when it comes to, to the technology ecosystem, I don't meet a customer that doesn't say, I need you to take the friction, so to speak, out of my security tech stack. And, you know, we could probably spend the rest of our time together talking about all the reasons why that is, but net net, nobody has enough people and you don't need the people working on things like trying to get the green lights to turn on and off. Um, you want, you know, the, the supplier to take care of that for you. And so um, one of our deepest partnerships is with CrowdStrike. Um, I, 
if you want to integrate Falcon with extra hop, you go to the wheel button, the settings button in extra hop, you drop down, it's four clicks. Like we could do it right now to enable it. And then all of a sudden, if you're working in extra hop, you can do a containment right in Falcon. Um, below that choice, you can integrate their threat intelligence. And uh, later at Falcon a couple of weeks ago, we announced we're going to embed uh, CrowdStrike's threat intelligence right in extra hop. And then even beyond that, we're going to begin support for log scale as people start to reimagine what the SIM might look like in their environment. And so uh, Crowd's our, our single best technology partner, most deeply integrated, um, but it doesn't stop there. You know, I mentioned zero trust architecture a little bit ago. Um, we did some great work with Netscope so that you can implement zero trust in an environment, you can deploy Netscope and yet you can still get the same visibility into uh, the network that you had before from extra hop. And so um, what are we trying to do? We're trying to remove friction for security professionals so that they can focus their time and attention on um, identifying threats. Well, thank you for that uh, you know, highlight of our partnership um, and also really just double clicking into the partnerships that you guys have invested in growing. Those are so strategic for so many of our mutual customers and really following the trend of modernization on every front. So very, very exciting stuff there. So we're going to do kind of a fun little exercise. We're going to move your seat on the rocket ship. You're going to be the CISO now. So much harder mm. job. Sorry. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, so you are the CISO of Acme Enterprise. So let's take a look at what you're prioritizing in this new seat in the next 12 to 18 months. And what's your game plan for executing against those goals? Yeah, so that you are you are right. That is a hard seat. And um, I'm sympathetic to that seat because um, when you're the CEO of a security company, I actually think you think about your CISO a little bit differently. Um, my, my CISO, uh, Mark and I are very, very close. Um, check out his interview from from Falcon if you get a second. He's former FBI, awesome guy, and just shared some really deep insights. So, so I think if I was at Acme Corp, however, and I didn't have Mark at my side, um, I, I do believe you need to start with identity. I think that's really important. And um, there's a lot of facets to that, so I'm not gonna pull on them all, but you, you really need to think about identity uh, particularly if, for instance, Acme uh, Corp was actually a hospital and you have a lot of workers that are in and out interacting with technology and maybe they don't physically or formally log in quite the same way. Um, so if you think about industry verticals, there's some really um, interesting nuances inside them related to identity. So part one would be identity. Um, part two would would be the endpoint and endpoint and kind of generally XDR. Um, for all intents and purposes, those attacks take place there. Containment happens there. Isolation happens there. Remediation happens there. And so uh, having a robust capability on the endpoint is necessary. And then probably not shockingly, um, third on my list would, would be network visibility um, up to and including this notion of building out some zero trust architecture. I, I think those are important projects I think they're harder to take from uh, brownfield than they are to do greenfield, which makes it a particularly complicated thing for a customer. Um, but getting as close as you can to something like that is pretty important. And you know that would up include integrating something that gives you visibility um, into what's happening on the network to deal with some of the generative AI things that we talked about earlier. So if Acme Corp was a bank, um, I would be worried about uh, getting to quantum resistant uh, encryption. And this might be the part where your audience asks if I wear tinfoil hats when I'm not on camera with you, but there's been some real advancements made in quantum that I think are gonna bring forward the date where um, general public key encryption might be compromised very, very quickly. And I think if I were in a banking environment or another environment that that had made you know robust use of that. I'd I'd be concerned with quantum, um, and then you know the last bonus one I'll give you that relates back to this generative AI question you asked is generative AI has also created a flywheel for the advancement of some of these other technologies like quantum. One of them has been deep fakes, and so 
I would also be concerned if I was running a company that um, required some sort of back to the identity point. How do you really validate identities? How do you really validate wire transfers in the modern world? Um, I don't think it's going to be as easy as just saying, let's get on camera so that I can validate that I'm, I'm talking to Tracy because the advancements there have gotten so good. So I'd, I, if I was at Acme Corp, probably my third or fourth priority would adjust a bit based on, you know, what, uh, what sector we were in or what industry we served. No, thank you for that, Patrick. That's, it's, it's incredibly insightful. And, you know, on your note about generative AI, AI, I mean, they're making it so user friendly with all of these that honestly a 12 year old could do it. And that's scary. Um, so we really just have to start preparing for it. Yeah. Yeah. I think the, um, you know, the, maybe one point we didn't cover on that, on the why, why you're going to have to deal with it. Um, go in the way back machine, Tracy, I'm sure this doesn't apply to you. It applies to me. Like I, I learned Excel because I knew there was going to be like a productivity bump from office products. Right. And there was a whole cohort of people that didn't do that and their skills atrophied. And, and, and frankly, you know, many of them went on to kind of say, okay, my career is wrapped up. There's a whole bunch of people working for all of us right now to your point around ease of use, looking at all these AI technologies and saying, I really need to learn this, regardless of what my employer wants, I need to learn this for the improvement and enhancement of my skills in my career. And I think that that's something all of us in, in leadership positions need to take really, really seriously. Um, we are not going to hold these employees back from self-improvement and I wouldn't, I certainly as a leader would not ask to hold anyone back from that self-improvement because I think it will be as meaningful as the people that decided not to get off pens and pencils and onto Excel and Word. There's a whole, there's a whole lot of time left in those people's careers and they're going to need to learn these things. Yeah. Oh, that's such an excellent point. And it, it goes into actually, if you kind of go back to your initial points about just the tools you're using about how they encourage employee retention in some ways this is yeah. actually like right in that same wheelhouse because if you can't throw your you know employees into the mix of what's modern what's current and make yeah. sure that their skills are sharp are sharp on things that are going to continue with them throughout their career they're not going to stay with you and so it's just a matter of keeping the right people on giving them the tools that they need to be successful both in your organization and beyond um, and that's, it's actually just says a lot about the culture of your organization as a leader. So we're, we're certainly thinking about it and, you know, um, we wrestle with the same things I outlined, um, all of them, but I, I'm very much in the camp of you're, you're not going to hold people back from this. And the other thing is, you know, we've, we're, we have a bit of an advantage because we've been taking on artificial intelligence and machine learning in the product for so long. You know, I think we're a little less scared because it's a core attribute to what we do in the product. And so we've learned some of these lessons, but the idea of opening the aperture to the human resources department and the marketing department and sales development reps and system engineers and service and support, like I, that's a, that's a much more daunting proposition, even for a company like ours that has some skills. Oh, very, very interesting conversation, Patrick. So I can tell that you just like to take it easy when you're not, you know, the CEO of Extra Help when you're when you're in your downtime post five. Um, so we all know that's not true. So you you are a self described foodie. In fact, you own a restaurant in Denver, which is a place that many of us visit called Point Easy. Um, can you share with us a little bit about that uh, so we can actually come and visit you? <laughs> Yeah. So first of all, yeah, total point easy plug. Come visit point easy in Denver. Tell them Patrick sent you. Uh, it's a passion project that uh, four of us put together during COVID. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure everyone knows the restaurant business was not a great business during COVID. And I had some some friends who were in that industry for a long time. And we looked at each other one day and we, were, we uh, saw this building and we we're like, we should, we should put a restaurant there. And so we took kind of the tail end of COVID to um, refurb this restaurant and, and, and build it out. And it opened um, a year ago in June. Um, and it's been really, really awesome. Uh, our chef Carlton is amazing. He just did a segment on Denver 7, showed everybody how to make a new brunch item this week. And um, it's fun to work with those folks on special projects. We did a, uh, 
30 day dry aged a five Wagyu strip loin together that we broke down a week ago and then threw on the menu. And most of the trips I take to Italy are to source products. So usually once a year we go to Italy and we try to find something new to put on the menu. So we have, uh, one of the only, I believe we're the only restaurant in the United States right now, right now with a Marchese El Ferry wine on the list. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun, but I do take it seriously. <laughs> <laughs> no, that that's awesome. That, uh, can you, do you have any carryover from your, from your day job that seeps into your restaurant business that you can share with us? The one thing that's interesting about the two, it's two sides of the same coin. Um, so first of all, the key to the restaurant business is that you're in the experience business. It's what, what we always say to, uh, to our staff, you, it, the food is amazing, but it's beyond the food. People go to those types of places for an experience. And so the thing that I would say is common is like the element of surprise. We have some kind of surprise in our dishes that seem, and some of the things that we offer that seem to like really land with customers. And I think my day job is mainly dealing with people that got surprised. And so <laughs> I see both sides of, of that coin. <laughs> oh, that's, that's wonderful. Well, we'll, we'll definitely be there to, uh, to visit point easy and, and give it a shot. Um, it, it sounds amazing. Yeah. Come on, come on. Wonderful. Well, before we wrap here, um, on this episode of meet the chief, can you share with us any of your parting comments, both to the folks listening who are, on our side of the industry who are at WWT and, and many other orgs, as well as a lot of our shared customers. Sometimes subjects that become really popular fade away fast. Don't let that one fade away fast. That's gonna, that's gonna be something we deal with. You know, if Tracy, we shot one of these every year for the next 10 years, that will be a topic for, for that whole, that whole time. And then some, and if you're anchored in fear, you need to change your perspective and anchor an opportunity and work that issue from the opportunity back to the risk. If you anchor in the fear of the risk, you're going to miss what might be the biggest thing that happens in our lifetime. As we know, retaining talent in cyber is a huge challenge across the industry. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about giving apps, how giving access to tools and a culture of uh, modern technology aids in, in this issue. Yeah. So one thing we found that's really, really interesting about this generative AI space is um, the computers are actually pretty good at self-describing the computers, which is a big advantage for the people that, you know, Tracy, you and I care most about in cyber. And, um, you know, one of the reasons why we struck this partnership with CrowdStrike and specifically said we were committed to adding our information into log scale and kind of challenging the SIM was because both crowd and extra hop believe we can use generative AI tools um, to interface into all those things and help the productivity level, you know, of the folks in cyber so that they don't have to do um, so much routine work just to try to get to the answers that they want. So we think there's a real productivity boost to be had for these people and, um, you know, just generally make their lives easier. You know, that said, um, in the CEO chair, I actually would kind of pan out and tell you for any role and specifically for any role where somebody might be earlier in their career, I think candidates are going to evaluate how open a company is to giving people access to and supporting them in this kind of retooling to take good advantage of generative AI. And, and so I do think right now there's an opportunity for it to be a differentiator as an employer generally. Um, and, and, you know, certainly I believe it's going to have a big impact on the folks that we care about in cyber. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent agree. I think it, it really brings people who are passionate about leveraging new tools and really expanding their own skill set um, to the table, which is, which is what we all want. And it's great for them as well. hundred percent. Well, thank you so much for the great conversation, Patrick. It was, uh, it was extremely insightful just learning more about what you guys do as an organization and even better meeting you as a person and really putting a face to the organization. So for our viewers, if you guys want to learn more about ExtraHop, visit our platform, www.com, search ExtraHop, and you'll see a bunch of goodness in the form of technical briefs as well as articles. Thanks again. Thank you so much.